Okay, good. And uh, let's carry on where we left off before. I'll see if we can get up my uh, screen sharing again. I'll get up the um, uh, dependent origination. Let's see where we are. Let me get myself sorted out, which is a, would be a uh, wow. What's going on here? Um, too many things going on. Uh, it's treasure. Okay, here we are. Okay. Okay. Hey. Okay, so there we are. So let's just uh, continue where we left off. So I was just saying very fast, I was talking pretty fast to always, but I was running out of time, but uh, uh, I was just saying that um, the uh, looking at the condition for the six sense fields, uh, and we're saying that name and form uh, are the condition for the six sense fields. Uh, and uh, name and form, the way to understand this uh, is essentially as four of the five khandhas. Yeah, we have the fifth khanda, which is uh, consciousness, consciousness just being awareness or the ability to know anything at all. Uh, and then the remaining four of the five khandhas is really what is included within name and form. We have the form part, which is the rupa khanda, yeah, the physical form or uh, the form, visual form or whatever. And then you have the nama, the name, which is the uh, uh, the three, basically the three other khandhas. Uh, it's interesting, right? The word, Pali word is nama, and in English it is name. And of course, these words are the same. They have the same root. They come from the same language, uh, part of the Indo-European language groups. Uh, so that's why they are so recognizable. And if you look at almost all the European languages, the word name is very similar. Uh, anyway, as far as I know, most of the European languages, it is very, very closely related. Uh, but um, let's not go into too much linguistics, maybe. Let's uh, leave that aside for another time. Maybe we can have a Pali course at Venomachanda one day. That'd be a good idea. We can look at all of these etymologies and things. <laughs> but uh, for now, let's just stick to uh, uh, these, uh, these issues. They're complex and uh, are already here. And um, uh, just going fairly quickly, the uh, condition then for name and form, uh, what is that? Uh, Surprise, surprise, it is consciousness. Consciousness is a condition for name and form. And um, this is a very interesting statement in dependent origination because uh, uh, what this does, it shows you that consciousness depends uh, not only is consciousness a condition for name and form, uh, but in other suttas, it says that name and form itself is a condition for consciousness. Uh, yeah, so it's like two things that are mutually dependent on each other. They support each other in a sense. And uh, that is very interesting because what it means is that uh, these things cannot exist independently of each other. And this is one of the great revolutions that brought to the spiritual life. And this is why he changed what made the Buddha so different from all the contemporary people at the time uh, two and a half thousand years ago, because pretty much everyone had this idea of consciousness or the self or Brahma or whatever it was, an independent entity that can exist uh, basically forever on its own. Huh? And then the Buddha comes around and says, no, it's not really, that's a kind of a nice theory. It's a nice ideology. It is um, uh, something that you might believe in, but actually it doesn't correspond to reality. Reality is that consciousness itself depends on other factors for its existence. So specifically, it depends on name and form, and name and form depending on consciousness. And um, what that means is that uh, this whole idea of there being anything which is independent, which exists on its own, uh, uh, independent of conditions, uh, which, uh, as it says in the suttas, it stands, uh, 
uh, it's called the mountain peak. This is one of the ways it is described in the suit as the self is like a mountain peak, solid, cannot be blown over by wind or weather or anything like that. Uh, that whole idea is a mistake, according to Buddhism. Everything is conditioned, including consciousness itself. If there's anything that distinguishes Buddhism from all other philosophies, all other religion, certainly the Vedic religion, the ancient Brahmanism and all that, if there's one thing, it is this, yeah, that there is nothing at all that corresponds to this idea of an Atman, a self, including consciousness itself. This is the, like, like the radical departure of uh, uh, Buddhism from everything else. Uh, so consciousness is a condition for name and form. Uh, and there is another, uh, the other way of understanding this uh, for, um, uh, uh, which is kind of which is relevant here, uh, is the idea that consciousness uh, here, here mean the consciousness reborn. Yeah, when you get reborn, consciousness arises and it gets established in a certain realm. And these realms are called the stations of consciousness. It's like your mind is stationed at the level. Yeah, you get reborn, they are fixed at that level for that particular life. And then you are fixed with fixed as beings. Yeah, you cannot become an animal even if you want to. Well, you know, a metaphorical animal, you know what I mean? People are like animals sometimes. But, um, but you cannot really live in these other realms, yeah? You are stuck, in a sense, uh, where you are. Yeah? And that is the state of consciousness. And when consciousness is stationed in a certain place, in a certain realm, uh, then the experiences you have in that realm are fixed to a certain extent. If you are a human being, you can expect human experiences, uh, so name and form, all the aspects of personality, yeah, they take the shape according to where consciousness is stationed. So if consciousness is stationed in the human realm, you can expect to experience human stuff. What human beings, what, what is it that human beings experience? Well, we experience, you know, uh, you know uh, <laughs> things that are kind of nice, but not super nice. Yeah, we experience nice, reasonably nice food, reasonably nice landscapes, nice... Uh, a reasonably nice entertainment and all of that, but it's also kind of a downside to human existence. Uh, so your perceptions, uh, uh, your uh, uh, your um, will even, the forms that you see, all of this is shaped by where consciousness is stationed. Uh, and then if you're stationed in a day by loka, of course, your experiences will be shaped by that. Uh, yeah? So name and form take a certain shape, take a certain shape and name and form conditions the six sense spaces. Uh, you experience the world in a certain way, depending on where you are established. Uh, yeah? So this kind of shows you how samsara kind of functions. Uh, yeah? And then because of those six sense spaces having a certain, uh, having certain limits, uh, yeah? a certain range, if you like, okay. And you experience on that, and you have corresponding feelings, etc., going all the way up to death and suffering and all of that. But uh, let's leave that aside. So, what then is the condition for consciousness? Yeah, why is there consciousness, or how is consciousness affected by other factors on the path? And one of the ways, or in the Dhamma, one of the is the idea that name and form is a condition for consciousness. It cannot exist by itself. But the reality is that consciousness is also conditioned in, a, uh, in its uh, brightness or its, uh, in its uh, qualities. Yeah? And that conditioning, which conditions consciousness in its brightness, is called uh, here called choices. Choices are a condition for consciousness. The word behind choices here is the very important word sankara that you find in the And the word sankara is essentially uh, the same as the word chaitana. Chaitana meaning the will, yeah, the will um, uh, in terms of all of these kind of things. Here translated by Bhante Sujato as choices, uh, which really is a very similar kind of thing. Uh, you choose the uh, things in the world. Uh, as a consequence, you, uh, you, you know, you are, you're creating kamma, basically. This is what this really is about. So whenever we make a choice, whenever we make a decision about anything, yeah, we are actually getting kamma. Yeah? And this is what this is about. So when your choice is a good one based on wholesome 
uh, motivations uh, based on kindness or whatever, uh, then you tend to feel good about yourself. Uh, yeah, you, uh, we all know that, I think, to some extent. Uh, and of course, when you feel good about yourself, what is actually happening is that you are brightening up your mind. Uh, you feel more at ease, you feel more bright inside, uh, you feel a larger degree of happiness, perhaps because you're living in the right way. Uh, so positive choice it affects consciousness in this way, in brightening up the consciousness. It is as if the qualities of consciousness are affected by sankara, by our choices. And this is the whole idea of kamma. Yeah? Kamma in Buddhism is the relationship between intention and how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about the world, a direct relationship. And here, actually see that relationship in action. And if you make bad choices, if you make choices based on unwholesome motivations, you say something bad, you do something bad, you tend to feel a bit bad about yourself. Yeah, you know what it's like, you feel a bit negative, I shouldn't have said that, or even if you don't think I shouldn't have said that, it's almost as if you are, you lose some of your energy because you know you did something that wasn't appropriate. Yeah, ill will, negativity always leads to lost energy. High energy people, and it basically comes from this purification, living in the guy, then the energy tends to rise as a consequence. So you can see here that we have a balance of sankara as a balance of choices. And uh, the more good choices you make, the more you brighten up the consciousness, uh, the less of the bad choices you make, the more, more you leave out the effects on consciousness uh, you're basically lifting up your mind lifting up the consciousness uh, this is what is happening here uh, and this is really what kamma is all about your consciousness is affected directly by your action. and um, it's really worthwhile understanding this uh, yeah it's really worthwhile uh, trying to see how this works in your own life if you observe your mind very carefully you will actually be able to see that it just does become more brighter. You feel more energized. You feel more happiness in your life and all of these kind of things. And also see that when your choices are bad, feel how it actually... Uh, it uh, detracts from the energy actually is reduced as the consequence. And you can actually feel this relationship directly. Yeah. And when you feel it directly, it becomes a very powerful source for living well, yeah, because you can see uh, how you're letting yourself down, basically, and yeah. that's the way of uh, encouraging yourself uh, to, uh, to have the right kind of motivations uh, in the way you live. So sankharas in our consciousness, and you can then see uh, as you develop your mind in this way as you uh, keep on this, keep on making choices and uh, yeah it's like your mind has a very similar territory that we were uh, at the beginning of dependent origination uh, when we were talking about upadana the asping and also the existence and then how that leads to rebirth a parallel to that process, but coming from the position of intention and choices instead. Uh, yeah, so mind is affected by these choices. Uh, our mind is kind of heading in a certain direction. The choices make are choices that are based on what we think it lines towards. And if we are interested in the sen sensory world, then we make choices related to the sensory world. And for all of these things, they incline the mind in a certain way. And when you die, the consciousness then gets established in the realm, corresponds to that inclination of consciousness that we build over time. And the balance of good and bad choices will then decide uh, what exact uh, realm, if you like, what exact rebirth you then have as a consequence of that. Uh, but uh, let's come to the very last factor here. What is the uh, condition for choices? Uh, yeah, this becomes the last one. And uh, the condition for choices is, yeah, we talked about ignorance before. Uh, this uh, very important part word, avidja, 
which means delusion, a lack of understanding, a, a misapprehension of reality, not seeing things as they actually are, yeah? All of these things, that, that is the condition for choices. We do things in the world. We create things precisely because we are ignorant. Kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, ignorance delusion leads to all of these choices that we have. Uh, and uh, why is that? What is actually oh, briefly the uh, the way that delusion is described in the suttas usually involves a misunderstanding of the three characteristics of existence. Uh, yes, the three characteristics of existence are impermanence, uh, suffering, uh, and non-self. Uh, and if we don't see these three characteristics as they actually are, then that is basically ignorance. So what one of the problems is that we then take things to be happy, which actually are not all that Yeah, things that really are ultimately suffering, we see them as one of the big problems, one of the kind of core issues that... Uh, one of the core aspects of this delusion that we have, uh, thinking that something is happy when actually it is suffering here. Yeah. So because of that, because we think that there is happiness to be found, for example, in the sense of realm, uh, we think that there's real happiness to be had there, not just impermanent happiness, but real happiness that is sustainable and something you can enjoy for a long time, and you can control something that you are in charge of uh, then what you do is you go out into the world and you try to acquire that happiness. Yeah, you go because you think you know what you're doing. You think you have understood these things are to be found and discovered. You actually try to achieve that kind of happiness. So you go out and you look for, you try to acquire whatever it is that you, where you, ever you believe happiness is in relationships or material well-being or whatever it might be. And you live a life that uh, whereby you pursue these things and that becomes the choices that you make. And of course, the reason is because you are really looking in the wrong place. Uh, but as your ignorance decreases and as you realize that actually there isn't so much happiness to be found maybe in those things, uh, then you start to look differently on life. Uh, you start to instead uh, look for the happiness in uh, kindness, you start to look for it in meditation practice, in the inner happiness that we build for ourselves. Uh, so your choices change. Uh, your choices become more wholesome. Uh, your choices become more suitable, suitable for raising your consciousness, making your consciousness brighter, Yeah, like I mentioned before. Uh, so that is one aspect of our ignorance. The second aspect is the feeling of uh, being in charge. Uh, yeah, the feeling of being an agent in our life who can, uh, who can actually affect happiness in our life, uh, to do things and to create happiness in our life. Uh, but even that sense of uh, being an agent in the world, that too is a kind of, uh, uh, is problematic yeah, because that sense of agency itself is a delusion. We feel far more powerful than we actually are to, to affect these things in our life. Uh, the reality is that the world tends to go according to its own conditions uh, and whatever choices that we make, uh, often it doesn't actually have all that much effect on the world. Uh, and we don't really see the impermanence of the world for what it is. Uh. So we try to create happiness, uh, thinking that we're more powerful than we are uh, and uh, not really knowing where happiness is to have, not understanding the limitations of our own uh, uh, will uh, our own agency uh, and then we uh, on that basis acting on delusion acting on a misunderstanding of how things are uh, and uh, so this is uh, the uh, idea yeah as we act in this way we create karma then we station consciousness in a certain way when consciousness is stationed in a certain place then we have certain experiences as this name and form in a certain realm that name and form brings with it uh, uh, the six senses we experience for those six senses in a certain way we uh, and that experience is called contact the contact leads to feelings we feel the world uh, and because we feel the world we have to pray and to establish and to be able to uh, gratify our craving we cling to things we grasp to things we take them up all of these things in the world that we uh, 
uh, that we hold on to. Uh, and because we hold on to all of these things in the world, we tend to live according to that holding on. We live in a certain way. It's a kind of existence that we have. That existence uh, then drives us on to a new rebirth, and then it goes on and on in this way. Uh, that is the essential idea of dependent origination here. Uh. So there you are. That is uh, dependent origination in brief. Uh, and uh, I apologize for going so fast, but uh, it wasn't really supposed to be the main uh, teaching on this particular retreat, just to give you a kind of initial feeling. So I hope that made uh, some sense to you. Many of you will have heard these things before and you will have an idea what this is about. Uh, but for those of you who maybe haven't heard this before, uh, let this be just a foretaste of what actually um, dependent origination is all about. So, uh, there you are. So now that we have seen the root problem, yeah, ignorance is really the root condition that um, leads to the suffering in the world, that leads to the cycle of rebirth going on, it leads to all and that leads to all of these things. Uh, and the next question, well, can we take this back even further? What then, how then, what is the reason why we are ignorant we can understand the reason for ignorance uh, then presumably we can actually do something about it uh, yeah and this kind of becomes the next question uh, so i will very briefly look at another of my favorite suttas uh, i have lots of favorite suttas in fact all 5000 pages in the sutta pitika are really my favorite uh, it's, it's hard to find a sutta which is not inspiring if you know if you really understand them well and this one is uh, one very meaningful and very interesting. Yeah? And it shows really the causes for ignorance itself, uh, taking it back all the way to the root, yeah, the kind of the most uh, foundational problem. Uh, and then if you can understand the most foundational problem, uh, it starts to clear what, uh, and then that then becomes the uh, basis for the rest of this retreat, where we're going to talk about what to do with this, how we act, how we move forward uh, to uh, eliminate these problems in our life. Gradually, gradually, yeah, it's always a stage-wise thing, uh, and every step on that path uh, is going to be something which leads to a uh, degree of liberation from suffering, uh, more happiness, more joy, all of these positive things. Uh, every step is positive, let alone the final goal of this entire life. So um, uh, let us uh, uh, have a look at this next sutta. So to do that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen again. Uh, and there we are. And now I'm going to come to the sutta that I have kind of handed out to everyone. Uh, so um, the next sutta, which uh, discusses the origin of uh, ignorance of avidya, it actually is called the ignorance, the sutta itself. And uh, it is from the Anglikaya, the numerical discourses of the Buddha in the 10th chapter, and the 61st sutta in that chapter. So I will uh, read it out to you, and I will discuss the sutta in a, a bit of detail afterwards. And so here we have the Buddha speaking, and this is what he says. I say that ignorance is fueled by something. It is not fueled. And what is the fuel for ignorance? You should say the five hindrances. I say that the five hindrances are fueled by something. They are not unfueled. What is the fuel for the five hindrances? You should say the three kinds of misconduct. What is the fuel for the three kinds of misconduct? you should say lack of sense restraint. What is the fuel for the lack of sense restraint? You should say lack of mindfulness and situational awareness. What is the fuel for lack of mindfulness and situational awareness? You should say improper attention. What is the fuel for improper attention? You should say lack of faith. What is the fuel for lack of faith? You should say, listening to the untrue teaching. Yeah. What is the fuel for listening to the untrue teaching? Yeah. You should say, associating with bad people. 
So there you are. Yeah, very uh, fascinating. And it comes to a very clear conclusion in a stead. Yeah, the root, the very bottom line is associating with the wrong kind of people. I think these are called um, uh, asapurisa, not inferior people or something like that might be a way of translating it. Uh, yeah, this is kind of root here in this whole thing, uh, going via a large number of steps coming down to this. Uh, so uh, this really is saying is that if we associate with the right kind of people, uh, we will overcome ignorance. That's what it's saying. All you have to do is associate with the right kind of people. Who are the right kind of people? Well, the Buddha, yeah, he is certainly the right kind of person. Uh, anyone who speaks Dhamma, which accords with the way the Buddha taught, uh, they are also the right kind of person. Uh, okay, so this is uh, fascinating, and this is really all you have to do. According to Buddha. But uh, before I get to that, before I talk more about the very first factor here, which is so important, I want to kind of uh, go through this in a little bit of detail, first of all, starting from the very top. So ignorance is fueled by something, and it starts off by saying it is fueled by the five hindrances. Yeah, and I expect that many of you will have heard about the five hindrances. And yeah, they are, of course, the uh, uh, desire for the sensory world, uh, yeah, worldly pleasures, uh, and uh, they are ill will, uh, they are tightness and lethargy, uh, they are restlessness and remorse, uh, and then doubt as the fifth one. Uh, those are the five hindrances. Uh, yeah, and uh, of those five hindrances, the first two ones uh, are actually the most important ones. Uh, so if you think about it in that way, you can say that it is the interest or the desire for the five sense world and ill will, uh, these other fuels for ignorance or for delusion. So if you have a lot of desire in that five sense world, if you have a problem with ill and anger or whatever, actually what you're doing is you're fueling delusion of the mind. And this is interesting in so many ways because the five hindrances is one of those critical things on the Buddhist path that we talk about all the time. It is one of the things that we overcome through the practice of morality and moreover overcome through the practice of meditation. Yeah, this, are, this is kind of a standard way of discussing the problems of meditation practice. And, and so that's really all we have to do. Yeah, overcome the five hindrances. And when you get rid of these blooming five hindrances, that is when delusion is gradually eliminated. You're stopping to fuel that delusion. That's kind of good news, isn't it? Because the five hindrances is something we can know something about, is something that we are used to talking about. So if that eliminates delusion, wow, that is a kind of a really handy. How does this work? And it's actually very simple to think about it. One of the things I mentioned the other day is the idea that desire always has a vested interest in the object of the desire. If you are attached to something, it means that you, by definition, you have a vested interest in that thing and you are going to do things to secure that for yourself. You're not going to be willing to let it go very easily. Huh? Yeah, So you are going to look at it with a biased kind of view. Huh? And that is the problem with all desire. All desire is biased in a certain way. Huh? And because it is biased, the bias is the opposite of seeing things according to reality, the opposite of seeing things clearly. Huh? So that bias drives the ignorance, it drives the delusion, huh? and it makes the mind not see things in the right way. Huh? Yeah, it is kind of, it is very obvious when you think about it. But the thing is that this is also very subtle. Huh? Yeah, very, the kind of desires that we talk about here, the coarse desires, you can see this very easily. Huh? But it's also true of the very refined desires. Huh? So what we have to do is eliminate all desires, because only when all desires are gone, huh, is the mind seeing, is the mind capable of seeing things clearly without any kind of vested interest huh? Yeah, it's sort of, I think it is, I don't know, to me anyway, it's fairly clear why that must be the case. Uh, ill will is exactly the same problem. Yeah, when you have ill will to somebody, uh, you're not seeing them clearly at all. Uh, you're seeing the negative side, you are focusing on the things that is not attractive in that person. 
And so ill will is also a kind of vested interest. It is a biased kind of outlook, looking at people in the wrong way. So again, it is something that you have to overcome completely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and ideally, you have a mind of boundless metta and kindness instead. That is kind of the ideal we're striving for. Yeah. And that is where you have the possibility of seeing things clearly. Yeah. So this shows you something about why these five hindrances matter so enormously. Yeah. When those five hindrances are completely eliminated, when they are completely gone, it means that there is no fuel for delusion because delusion has no fuel, or you could say nutriment, or you could say support. It means delusion is weak at that point. And because delusion is weak, because it's lacking in support, after you have abandoned the five hindrances, that is the time for insight. That's when you can overturn delusion. Overturning delusion is the same thing as insight because delusion has no support anymore. It's like it's naked. It doesn't have anything to, um, to help it, so to speak. And then uh, if you uh, are ready, you think about the Dhamma in the right way, you have clarity about what you're doing, you have meditated well, you have gone deep, and then you reflect on the five khandhas after you come out of a deep meditation. We're going to talk about this later on. This is all very exciting stuff, how to actually do this kind of reflection. Uh, then bang, one day, everything is overturned. Uh, you see the world in an entirely new way, in a way you have never seen the world before. Uh, everything is returned. Uh, yeah? It's like um, things suddenly, what seemed to be up suddenly is down. What was to be down is now up. Left becomes right and right becomes left. Uh, everything is reversed from what it used to be. Uh, and that is kind of the power of these kind of insights. Uh, that beautiful verse again about what the Aryans think is uh, suffering. Uh, now, what the Aryans see as suffering, the ordinary people think is happiness. But what Aryans see as happiness, ordinary people think is suffering. Yeah. It's almost as if you reverse your view of reality. Yeah. So the five hindrances. And it doesn't say this particular sutta how these five hindrances are overcome. Uh, but it says that in the reverse sequence, this sequence also has a reverse side to it, uh, which shows how we support True knowledge and vision. True knowledge and vision is vidya and vimuti. Yeah, vidya, true knowledge, vimuti, liberation. And uh, how is that done? Well, it is done through practicing the seven factors of awakening. And the seven factors of awakening are very close to some of the teachings we're going to look at later on. Uh, and the seven factors of awakening are all about the qualities of mind that lead to awakening here. What are those qualities? Uh, well, they are qualities of joy. Tranquility, uh, yeah, uh, energy of the mind, uh, samadhi, the stillness of the mind, equanimity, uh, mindfulness, uh, and investment principles. So it's all these marvelous qualities, yeah. It's kind of one of the most amazing things about the Buddhist path. Uh, not only are we searching for the highest happiness in the world, uh, but the path itself is so powerful. Uh, the path itself is full of these, these kind of. Uh, uh, marvelous qualities that we build up over time, uh, the happiness, the joy, and all of these kind of things. Uh, so what's not to like about this path? It's kind of, uh, it's just extraordinary. The result is extraordinary. The path itself also is very beautiful. It's not like you have to torture yourself for 40 years and then kind of finally experience greatest happiness. Uh, no, it's a gradual movement towards a greater degree of happiness, stillness, and peace. Uh, it's just... Uh, I don't know what to say. It's just amazing. Yeah, I'm not sure why the whole world isn't Buddhist. I reckon the whole world should be Buddhist. I think that is the obvious kind of the conclusion here, but uh, yeah, not the way it is, unfortunately. Anyway, or maybe is it unfortunate? I'm not sure. Whatever. So what then causes the seven awakening? Factors and what causes the seven awakening factors is the four satipatthanas, the four mindful meditations. This is all about how to meditate, including how to do the breath meditation. Yeah, the breath meditation is really the uh, kind of the, the main way of pursuing the satipatthana meditation, how it is described in the suttas. So, so that is how we all have the five hindrances. Satipatthana and then awakening factors on top of that. 
So just to show you the reverse here, what is happening here. So uh, what is the fuel for the five hindrances? Uh, and the answer here is the three kinds of misconduct. Three kinds of misconduct means misconduct by body, speech, and mind. Yeah, the unusual thing to talk about in Buddhism, we always divide conduct into these three realms, body, speech, and mind. And uh, uh, the opposite is good conduct in these things. Uh, so what we're arriving for here is practicing good conduct in these three areas. Uh, so again, it's very obvious what we should be doing. Yeah, we all know what it means to have good conduct in body and speech. Uh, we know what it means to have good conduct in mind. Yeah, to have a sense of compassion and uh, uh, good feelings for the people around us is really what it is about. It's kind of obvious what we have to do. Yeah, and then that translates into uh, reducing the five hindrances, which then translates into uh, giving up delusion itself. Yeah, so the five hindrances uh, are supported by the misconduct. What is uh, the fuel for the misconduct? And it says here it is the lack of sense restraint. Uh, this is a very, another very interesting thing, and it may sound Maybe scary for some of the idea of sense restraint. Maybe you think that's some terrible curse to have to restrain your senses and you cannot enjoy anything anymore. The world becomes just utterly boring and gray. There's nothing to be done, that is, there's nothing of interest in the world. And now it might as well commit suicide straight away. That suicide might, maybe suicide is the ultimate sense restraint, no more, nothing more to be done. But that would be to misunderstand what is going on. Uh, sense restraint is not really terrible at all. Sense restraint just means that we understand the limits of always pursuing what looks beautiful in the world, uh, yeah? always uh, getting away, having aversion, and the anger to the negative things of the world. Uh, sense restraint is an act of wisdom. Uh, an act of wisdom where we live kind of evenly in our lives instead of always going up and down allowing our emotions to be in charge instead we live evenly we live in a way whereby we stand back we have a degree of mindfulness we don't allow ourselves to be pulled by the nose all the time always wobbling around going this way going that way desiring this having aversion towards that because we understand it is just painful. We understand it is destabilizing. We understand it's impossible to have real mindfulness and clarity if we allow ourselves to be pulled around in this particular way. So then we use sense restraint. And uh, this is one of the really interesting areas on the Buddhist path, the idea of sense restraint. It may sound like it is an act of willpower because it uses the word restraint but actually sense restraint really is more about wisdom being wise about the world thinking about the world in the right way and when you do that restraint happens automatically it's not something that you have to do it just happens by itself so what is the fuel for a lack of sense restraint lack of mindfulness and situational awareness yeah we talked about this very briefly before situational awareness is the understanding of doing what is appropriate at any particular time uh, appropriate means that it is appropriate for uh, for if going forward on the buddhist path yeah for developing your mental and spiritual qualities uh, that is what appropriate means here so you have a clarity am i moving forward on the spiritual path am i moving backwards have i got these things right or not yeah that is situational awareness and of course if you haven't got that if you go to all the wrong places you hang out with the wrong people you uh, you know you then of course what's going to happen is you're going to get more desires you're going to have lots of desire is coming up you probably have a lot of ill will and anger because you are doing foolish things and all of this so having a degree of understanding what is appropriate uh, hanging out in the right place uh, is a very important part of this and to be able to do that uh, you have to have some degree of mindfulness you have to have some degree ability to see what is happening around you whether you're doing the right thing or not uh, so this is a bit technical i should probably go through this a bit faster then we have the, uh, the fuel for lack of mindfulness and situational awareness is improper attention. Ayoniso manasitara in Pali 
you could say unwise attention yeah so you are not thinking about the world in the wise way you don't really understand what is going to lead to your detriment and what is going to lead to your happiness you look at things that you shouldn't look at as improper attention you think about things you shouldn't really think about you uh, you, uh, you you get angry and upset because you are looking at people with the wrong kind of eyes with the wrong kind of motivation and intention this is Ayoniso Manasikara. Yeah? It is always when the unwholesome qualities increase, it is always Ayoniso Manasikara, improper attention. And when the wholesome qualities do increase, that is Ayoniso Manasikara, wise attention. It's very, again, another very interesting area, this whole idea of proper attention, improper attention. How do we relate to things around us? How do we, when we, Whenever we, attention here just means any time that you have an experience almost, that is, there's an act of attention there because you are directing your mind towards something, yeah? Whenever you direct your mind to something, it is a kind of attention in that. Yeah? So you attend to things. Yeah? And that can be done in the right way. It has to do with the qualities of mind that you bring to that attention, or it can be done in the wrong way, which drags you down and increases the defilements and makes life more miserable miserable yourself. So um, a very important concept on the Buddhist path. Uh. So where does that improper attention come from? Uh? And interesting, yeah, improper attention, unwise attention comes from a lack of faith, uh, he says here. Uh. And uh, this is interesting because uh, uh, faith and wise or unwise attention. Uh, somehow wise attention and faith are, are somehow connected together here. It's like wisdom and faith yeah, are connected together. And uh, this is a very typical Buddhist way of thinking about the world, that the, the distinction between faith, or you could argue maybe confidence if you like, because confidence might be a more appropriate word to use in this context that faith and confidence uh, sorry confidence and wisdom or faith and wisdom are really just two sides of the same coin when you are wise when you see the world in the right way uh, you also have a lot of faith uh, because you recognize the buddhist teachings having the right understanding of this uh, when you have a, a degree of confidence and faith, then you also have wisdom, because that confidence in the Buddhist teachings, it tells you how to attend to the world in the right way. And that is a kind of wisdom. Yeah, you have faith in something that you should have faith in. You have faith in something which is appropriate, not the wrong kind of thing. So wise attention or unwise attention or wise attention starts with faith in the teachings of the Buddha. Yeah, the Buddha tells you this is how to attend in the right way and then because of that confidence in the teachings you start to attend as the buddha tells you you should be attending here yeah so it's kind of wisdom arising from confidence so wisdom arising from faith and then you use that to uh, as a uh, springboard to then make this whole sequence uh, work for yourself it's a uh, a very kind of Buddhist way of thinking about things. And it shows you that the Buddhist idea of the world is actually very different from many other uh, religions and philosophies, because most religions, we would say that faith is something that is completely unconnected with wisdom, completely unconnected with understanding, completely unconnected with seeing things according to reality. For many religions, faith is an end in itself. Yeah, you have faith. And, uh, in, and it doesn't matter if that faith is rational. That's kind of completely irrelevant. If you have faith, then you're okay. But in Buddhism, it's the exact opposite. Faith is only rational, only appropriate, if it is connected with wisdom. It should be wise faith. It should be something that actually relates to reality. If it doesn't re relate to reality, if it has nothing, if it is kind of... Um, life or something uh, to that effect that it is really problematic it has to reflect the world around it only then is it a real kind of faith and confidence so uh, that is i don't know to, but to me this that seems so obvious that that is the kind of confidence and faith that we want in this world because it 
is something that supports us in a in a much more positive way. It actually relates to reality. You don't have to reject science or anything like that. In fact, quite the opposite. If you're searching for truth and wherever truth is found, that is where you should also accept it. Anyway, where does that faith, lack of faith come from? Lack of faith comes from listening to untrue teachings. So if you want to have faith and confidence, you have to listen to truth. Dhamma, the real Dhamma, the real teaching, the teaching that reflect reality, uh, teaching that actually have a real purpose and a real goal. Uh, how do you get to hear those true teachings? Uh, by associating with good people. Uh, if you associate with bad people, you hear the untrue teachings. Uh, if you associate with good people, you get to hear the true teachings. Uh, so this is like the rock bottom, what everything comes down to. It starts out by associating with good people. Why is that the case? Why does it start out by associating with good people? And the answer is, uh, and this is kind of comes back to this idea, that there is no self, there is no uh, uh, solidity inside of us, which is always stable, which guides you in the right direction. And because we are all subject to all the causes and conditions of the world, and that is basically what we are. Our personalities are built up out of these causes and conditions. Because that is all we are, then we need to have the right kind of conditioning. If we have the right kind of conditioning, we're going to be heading in the right way. If we have the wrong kind of conditioning, we're going to be heading the wrong way. Yeah. So the conditioning is everything. And of course, it matters enormously here. That we hang out with those people that are going to give us good teachings, good advice. If that conditioning is everything, then this is going to be essential yeah, for our ability to practice this path. So this is why in the suttas, it always says that you know, the um, uh, causes and conditions for becoming a stream entry, for seeing the Dhamma, one of those uh, causes and conditions is uh, what is called paratogosa. Paratogosa means... Uh, at the voice of another, yeah? Yeah, someone else's ah, basically Paratagosa. Pa Paratagosa was very memorably translated by someone as the voice from beyond. The voice from beyond was a kind of memorable translation. It was completely wrong, of course, but it was sort of interesting to show how you can uh, get these things wrong if you don't understand what you're translating here. Yeah? Because sometimes the Pali can be understood in many ways. Yeah? But Paratogosa is one of those critical factors. Yeah? And then in other places, you have the Buddha say things like the holy life is 100% of the holy life is spiritual friendship, Kalyana Mitta. Yeah? This is the same thing again, the idea that this is the foundation on which everything else rests. And without that, you're not going to be able to reach any of these milestones or any of these factors on the path. So it begins with associating with wise people. And then, uh, this is not part of this, but I'll tell it to you anyway before we start, go over to the Q&A. Then the Buddha has this beautiful simile. And I, I love this simile because it's so powerful in a way. It's so hard to really, almost to come to terms with a simile is almost difficult because it sounds over the top. It sounds, surely it can't be that simple as this. And this is what the Buddha says. Uh, yeah. So he says that, uh, um, you know, just like uh, rain falling on the mountaintop, uh, when the rain falls on the mountaintop, it forms into little streams and the crevices and creeks of the mountain. Uh, it flows down in these little streams. Uh, and then the little streams meet up. Uh, and the little streams meet up, they form larger streams. Uh, as the larger streams uh, build up, and it, it always depending on the rain continuing to fall on the mountain. As rain and rain on top of the mountain, and the streams become larger and larger uh, until they run into the lakes, uh, run into the small lakes. And as the rain keeps coming on the top of the mountain, uh, eventually the small lakes overflow. Uh, and when the small lakes overflow, uh, they come into little rivers, uh, and the rivers carry on. And as the Rain keeps falling on the top of the mountains. Those rivers start to swell. And eventually they go into the large lakes. And eventually if rain keeps on falling on the top of the mountain, 
Eventually, the large lakes too overflow, uh, and they overflow into the large river, the river Ganges and the river Brahmaputra, or whatever you have, the enormous rivers of the world. Uh, and if the rain keeps falling on the mountaintop, uh, eventually those large rivers uh, much reach the ocean itself. Uh, and there's only one cause, uh, only one condition uh, that is required for that rain, for those rivers to reach the ocean. Uh, and that one condition is that the rain keeps falling on the mountaintop. Uh, that is the symphony of the Buddha. And the rain on the mountaintop, what is that rain? It is associating with good people. So you have to keep on associating good people. And if you keep on doing that, if you keep on allowing yourself to be brainwashed, maybe brainwashed, I don't know if you like that word, but to be let's sort of like, let's use a more acceptable word, allowing yourself to be conditioned by these teachings. Yeah, the more you hang out with the good people, you hang out with the right people, the wise people, the conditioning is happening here you start to gain faith in these teachings and what is going on there because you realize that they are remarkably true to the way you experience the world. There's something about this teaching that is actually extraordinarily powerful. Yet yeah, you can recognize it in your own life. But as you practice these teachings, that recognition becomes even more powerful. It becomes so obvious that there's something true going on here. Of course, kindness is good. Of course, kindness leads to happiness, both for myself and other people. We all know that. Yeah, deep down, even though we can't practice it at all times, we know it to be true. So the faith arises as you do that. Your entire mindset starts to change. You start to change the way you live. You become, all of these things start to happen. And then all the time, coming back to these teachings, coming back to the good people, to guide yourself, to inspire yourself, to understand what is really going on. And it fills up, fills up, fills up. Yeah, proper attention, situational awareness, sense restraint, uh, the three kinds of good conduct. And as you practice the three kinds of good conduct, uh, you start to be able to meditate because this is the foundation that is required for meditation to happen. Uh, you meditate on the breath. Uh, you go into deep states of samadhi. Uh, you fulfill the seven factors of awakening. Uh, and when you fulfill the seven factors of awakening, uh, Keep on listening to the teachings. Keep on inspiring yourself. One day, the seven factors of awakening become complete. You reach the upeka, sambhujanga, the factor of awakening of equanimity itself. And then you shatter all the delusion in the world. And you reach the vijja vimutti, the very end of the path. The vijja, the true knowledge the insight into the nature of reality uh, and the vimutti, the liberation that follows with that. Uh, liberation from suffering, liberation from defilements, uh, liberation from all the negative things in the world. Uh, and you have come to the end of path. Uh, and all you have to do is to come back to these teachings. Uh, come back, associate with the right people. Who is the right person? Who are these right people? Number one of these right people is the Buddha himself. Uh, because this is where all of Buddhism comes from. Yeah? The Buddha is the one who had the insight. If there's anyone in the world who understands reality, who has the insight that Buddhism is supposed to have, it must be the Buddha. We might be uncertain about anyone else, but we cannot really doubt the Buddha. Because if you doubt the Buddha, all of Buddhism collapses. Everything else is built on the teachings of the Buddha, and everything collapses like a house of power if the foundation is no good. So we have to assume that the Buddha is right. So come back to his teachings, back again and again and again, and listen to teachings that accord with the teachings of the Buddha, inspire yourself, make yourself understand what is going on, and it's all the time, because it's so easy to forget in our daily lives. Yeah, it is so easy to even as a monk, sometimes I'm astonished how I can forget some of the most obvious things. I try to be kind all the time. I promise, I, I really do. Sometimes I sometimes I fail a little bit, you know, and I feel really bad about that. It's terrible. I, I'm supposed to remember these things, you know, because I kind of live this life, but it is really hard to do this. And so it is a, a, the way to overcome that uh, is to always come back to remind yourself uh, and then you're going to be on the right track. And one day you will also reach 
at the very end of this path uh, if you keep on practicing in that way. Uh, anyway, so uh, there you, you are. That's a good place to stop, I think. So, Venerable Chanda, would you like to, shall we move on to the Q&A? Yeah. Thank you, Ajahn. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, someone's asking that on Sunday you said the Dhamma is declining. Can you say more about this, please? About the Dhamma declining, okay. Um, I, uh, um, I think the Dhamma has, you know, if you go back and look at Buddhist history, Dhamma has pretty much been declining for almost two and a half thousand years already. Well, maybe, maybe not that much, but... Uh, the more time goes by, the more different kinds of Buddhism you get, uh, the more expressions of Buddhism, the more disagreements you have about uh, what Buddhism really is about, or what kind of various views you have around the world. Uh, and often it gets incredibly confusing. Yeah, it's difficult enough to are monastic, uh, even more hard when you are a lay person to be able to distinguish between real Dhamma and Dhamma, which is more... Um, you know, does not really accord with how the Buddha taught things. So this is what I really mean by the Dhamma being uh, diluted and being kind of, uh, you know, being um, losing that sense of uh, what the Buddha taught originally. Yeah. And uh, if you, you know, precisely that instead of listening to the word of the Buddha, we tend to listen to all kinds of other things. We listen to things that were written a long, long time after the Buddha, we look at the Abhidhamma, which is sometimes okay, but sometimes it can be misleading. We look at all kinds of teachers, and we allow these teachers to inspire us without really asking the very basic questions. Does it accord with how the Buddha taught these teachings? And uh, so this is how these things decline, and this is how the world gradually kind of moves into darkness. And there are some very interesting suttas about this, uh, where the Buddha actually makes precisely these kind of points. Where he says that, uh, you know, in the in the future, people will listen more to uh, poets. They will listen more to my disciples. And they will actually listen to the uh, the teaching, the profound teachings of the Tathagata, and turn to be very prophetic. That's exactly what is happening. People are listening to all kinds of teachings, uh, whereas they tend to forget the teachings of the Buddha uh, himself. Uh, so that is what I'm seeing in the world. And uh, maybe you know, there might be a little bit of a rejuvenation. Maybe we are coming back a little bit to the more original teachings again for a while. Uh, and then we lose it again. It comes and goes a little bit. Uh, but the trend, the overall trend, is, uh, I think, is downhill. And it's useful to remember that. Uh, because when you remember that, you know you are mind of the impermanence of everything in the world. Uh, including the teachings of the Buddha. And it gives you a bit of sense of urgency, a sense of now is the time. Now is when I have to do this. Who knows how much longer is possible to, to practice these things. Okay. Okay. Um, someone's asking, how does the dependency between consciousness and name and form work with beings that don't have bodies? In other words, that don't have form, material form. Yeah. So, um, um, first of all, the idea of form is actually quite a complex one. You know, there's many different ways of having form. Form is not just kind of human form. It's also the form of the deva realms. They don't have bodies quite the way we have, but they have more refined bodies. So the form actually goes quite high up in the sort of hierarchy of samsara. But then there comes a point when there is no form at all, that is true. And uh, when there is no form, then it is sufficient to have a name. Name is sufficient support for consciousness. So you don't actually have to have form. So when there is name, that means that your uh, contact with the world is also different. Yeah, I, I talked about before how we contact the world through uh, the physical sense organ and then actually um, working on that input with the mind. So that physical organ obviously is the pizza, and then it's an immediate mental experience that you have. So uh, it is possible to have consciousness supported entirely by name and actually leaving out the form. You don't, you don't need to have all the factors there. 
And this is true throughout origination. Yeah, you don't have to have all the six sense bases. You can live with one of them, the same kind of thing, just the mind, or you can have a, a few of them missing, perhaps. Yeah. And uh, so the, the whole sequence is a bit like that. It's sufficient to have one subfactor in each particular case. Make this uh, make this work. Okay. There's another one about consciousness here. Um, dear Ajahn, please can you clarify whether the consciousness independent origination refers to the six types of consciousness or the stream of con stream of consciousness, and the difference between these two? So it's the same thing. Yeah. Six the consciousness stream of consciousness is the, the same idea. The stream, just a metaphor for the our consciousness, you know, how it moves from one realm to another one, how it always comes and goes, and you have one sense and another sense. But within that stream, you have all the six kinds of consciousness within that stream. The stream itself includes all the kind of kind of the consciousness. That's different ways of uh, looking at the same problem. Yeah. So when you uh, when you get reborn, uh, you are taking consciousness with you, uh, and that consciousness that you bring with you is both a stream in the sense that it flows on from one life to, to another one, and it's also the six kinds of consciousness in the sense that when wherever you realize it, have access to all the six senses, uh, and therefore the six the sense consciousness is. Uh, so that there's different angles from the same problem. Thank you. Okay, someone's asking, how come sometimes I understand that things are impermanent and there's much less suffering, but sometimes I don't understand that suddenly anymore for times when being stressed, for example. Why is it that that insight sometimes goes away? <laughs> yeah. Um, again, this is the, the problem of the defilements sometimes when you get stressed the reason that you get stressed in part could also be some underlying defilements there as well at the same time and stress itself is a kind of a mental state that probably leads to a distortion of your outlook okay when your outlook is distorted it is actually very hard to see things clearly yeah so that is the same whether it's sensory or it is anger or whatever it is uh, even stress, it distorts. Okay. So very often, a good thing to do if you do feel stress is take try to take some time out, uh, try to step back a little bit. Yeah, go else, go for a walk in the forest, uh, sit down in a different place from usual, and close your eyes uh, and just chill. Uh, listen to a, a dhamma talk, listen to a guided meditation of someone you really trust and someone you really. Uh, respect and allow those words to sink in to take you out of that space that you're in because as long as you are in that stressful uh, space it's very unlikely that you will be able to see things clearly and because you can't see things clearly then you have lost that idea of impermanence uh, yeah and then you uh, you are stressed and you you forget that these things will change and that you you know down the track this too will pass uh, and then you have a have a problem uh, as, a, as a consequence uh, one of the you know, most important things in Buddhism is, in a sense, to prime ourselves for these kinds of situations. Uh, the more you reflect on these ideas, the more clarity you have about them, uh, the greater will be your ability to use them when problems do actually arise. Uh, yes, yeah? so the more clear we are in, at any time, uh, the more ability we have, we have to use this when things really do get difficult for us. Uh, so... Um, uh, so this is really I guess, uh, what is going on here. I would, I would say, uh, something like of clarity which comes from uh, uh, just a difficult situation. So try to stand back a little bit and see if you can get some perspective on what is going on. Uh, okay. Have you got many questions, Venerable? Is there a lot? Yes, or? we've got quite a yeah? few questions. Some of them also okay. require slightly long answers, maybe. Um, okay. Some are a little bit easier, probably. Uh, so I feel like I'm growing out of worldly interests. However, in meditation, it seems my body is trying to sabotage my efforts by constant aches and tiredness. Please help. <laughs> okay, that's great. I'm really, really glad for that you are losing some of the interest in the world because uh, that 
is uh, that's kind of a, it's a good thing, it's a positive thing, usually. Yeah. Um, so your body has, has flexible tightness. Well, the, um, the thing, you know, it, it's a difficult problem. It really depends on what, what kind of it is. But uh, usually sometimes you can actually just by changing your posture a little bit, by trying to do things in a different way, you can actually overcome some of those aches. And don't be afraid of trying anything really, anything goes as the patient is concerned. Uh, I, uh, I remember one of, the, uh, one of the great meditation masters I know about, uh, uh, a monk called uh, Ajahn Ganha. He came here to Bodhinyana Monastery in Perth many years ago. Uh, and he told us that he lies down to meditate. Yeah, And he's like, I don't know if he's an arahant, but he's pretty up there. He's kind of pretty astonishing. Uh, and uh, so uh, he was asked the question, well, if you, uh, when you lie down, what do you do? What do you do? You lie down and then, uh, and he says, well, I don't do anything when I lie down. Uh, and then he, and then we asked, well, well, if you don't do anything, don't you fall asleep? And they said, no, falling asleep, that would be doing something here. <laughs> yeah, so it's almost like if you fall asleep, it is like you turn off, yeah, you turn off a switch in your mind, you do something to actually fall asleep, but he doesn't turn off the switch, because it doesn't turn off the switch, he is just mindful. Huh? So if, so if he can do that, then I think lying down can be a posture which is allowable for all of us to use, not all the time, perhaps, but occasionally, especially if you have aches and problems, yeah, sitting on a comfortable chair, not indulging too much, but a reasonably comfortable chair is certainly okay. A few different postures, a lot of the aches and pains in the body can be overcome through good posture here. If there are other pains that you have that are more chronic uh, in nature, then uh, uh, you can also try to use medication, yeah, medication which does not make you too drowsy or uh, sabotage your meditation. It is okay to use medication in this way. So you can try that, but go carefully with it. Uh, and uh, if it is a real pain to do anything with, uh, uh, which is kind of permanent and uh, or whatever, then you're just going to have to try to live with it. You're going to have to try to say, okay, I can't do anything about this. There's no point in having aversion towards a negativity with it. Let me just try to sit with it. Yeah, sit with it, be with it, accepting the pain for what it is, understanding you can't do anything with it. And then in that way, try to uh, go beyond it by, uh, you know, doing some metta and kindness towards yourself, or whatever it might be, going beyond the pain, and then maybe you were able to find some peace by uh, that uh, problem. Uh, when it comes to the tiredness, um, again, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that, because the, the big problem with tiredness is usually the tiredness of the mind. I don't know if you mean tiredness in mind and body, but uh, if, if it is just the body is tired, yeah, you, you might be able to bypass that uh, yeah, and just go straight to the mind and just kind of uh, focus on mental energy instead, go to the breath or whatever. Uh, that may be possible for you to, uh, to do that. Uh, um, if the mind is all tired, then you need to try to find out the causes of that. Yeah, maybe you are working too hard or you are doing something that you ideally should not be doing. Maybe you can do something where your conduct is a bit more metta, loving kindness and compassion in your life. If you can build up that inner metta and loving kindness, often the tiredness gets dispelled very fast because is energy. Compassion, if done rightly, is also energy. It's energizing. Yeah. And then the, you, know, you will uh, uh, brighten up, hopefully, both the mind and the body at the same time. So try some of these things uh, and just uh, uh, and see what happens. Uh, and uh, if it doesn't work straight away, just uh, remember that uh, all of these things, they can be resolved. And sometimes it's just a matter of perseverance and commitment, and eventually you will overcome these things. Uh. Okay. We've got quite a few, uh, Jan. Um, yeah. So someone is asking, um, which edition of the Buddhist suttas you would recommend and how do we make the conditions that lead to happiness and spiritual development? 
Okay, yeah. So what, 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 the first one was which edition of the Sutta? Mm, yeah, which is? edition yeah, of okay. the Sutta? Okay. So uh, by edition, I assume you mean translation, probably? Probably. Yeah, uh, or, or maybe, probably, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that. So um, uh, it's hard to give any kind of absolute answer to that i would of course i would say my translations are the best ones yeah but that, that's not my translation <laughs> and unfortunately i haven't i haven't translated all that much i've translated all the boring stuff i've translated things like the vinya pitika with all the monastic rules and things that's what i've translated so uh, i would i really mention, would recommend you to read Adria. that you've got a big mention yeah, in here. okay <laughs> yeah in the end, get to it. <laughs> okay. you, you had a big yeah. influence <laughs> Yeah, that is one of the one that Venerable Chanda is just showing there is the uh, numerical discourses of the Buddha. Yeah, this is one of the what is known as the four Nikayas, the four um, uh, collections of suttas. So you have the long discourses, the middle length discourses, you have the connected discourses, and you have the numerical discourses. Yeah, this is what the four kind of uh, collections I would recommend you to read. Yeah, long. Discourses, middle length discourses, connected discourses, and numerical discourses. And uh, they, these come in different translations. One of the most influential translators uh, uh, is a monk called Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, who you may have heard of. He has uh, uh, that particular translation, which Venerable Chan has showed us right there, is actually done by him. He is the person behind that. Uh, and he translates, I must say, I really find his translations very beautiful and very, uh, you know, the, the language is just really flows nicely and it's, and it's nice. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some of the downside of the language may be sometimes a little bit too formal, perhaps. Yeah, you may not quite get the feeling that the Buddha is talking to you. you it doesn't sound like some, something people might say <laughs> in, in ordinary life, but maybe a little bit too much formality for my taste sometimes. Uh, uh, but there is another translator, and uh, this is a uh, uh, Bhante Sujat. And some of the translations I have here are uh, from him, and uh, they are more approachable translation, more immediate. Yeah, but he also has his little idiosyncrasies. Yeah, he has his own little ways, and you may not agree with all of those idiosyncrasies in translation. Uh, uh, the I, nice thing about Bhante Sujata's translation is that they're all available on the internet. Yeah, you, there's a website called suttacentral.net, suttacentral.net. And if you go there, all of these suttas are actually found there. And uh, you found all the translations by Bhante Sujata, but you also find a number of translations by Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi as well, uh, and a lot of other translations. That is a very comprehensive website. It is probably fair to say it is the world's premier number one website uh, when it comes to Buddhist translations. Uh, so it is a very good resource to go to, suttacentral.net. Uh, so um, that is what I would recommend. You just feel your way through it. How should you read the suttas? Read what you enjoy. Do not read what you don't enjoy. That, is, I think, is my main kind of recommendation. So if you kind of flick through the book, don't like the first sutta, okay, next to it, like the second, go to the third, don't like the third, go to the fourth, etc. Even if you only like one sutta in the whole collection, yeah, then you are on the right track. That's good enough. If you like zero suttas in the collection, <laughs> then go on to the next collection and see what happens. And don't force yourself yeah, to read things you don't enjoy because that really detracts from the entire purpose of these teachings, which actually is to create a sense of information and happiness and understanding what is going on. That is the whole purpose of this. And if you can get inspiration from the suttas, wow, it is so marvelous. Yeah, because then you get, get a feeling for what the Buddha is teaching, you get inspired at the same time, you get some joy, you get some gladness, you get the energy arising, you read the sutta, afterwards you sit down, you cross your legs and you meditate and you just, whoa, you're flying because you're inspired by the teachings. That is the ideal, yeah? It doesn't happen to all that many people, but that's kind of the, <laughs> that's the ideal way of reading the suttas. So. so how do we get that joy and happiness? Well, that's how you get it. This is one way of doing it. Uh, simply by just getting inspired by this 
spiritual genius called the Buddha who lived two and a half thousand years ago, who understood everything about human suffering and happiness. And just the idea that you have a teacher who understands everything about happiness and suffering is just so awesome. Yeah, it is just so amazing. How is it possible that a being even exists in the world to have full insight into the very foundations of what it means to be human? Isn't that kind of astonishing? The more you reflect on that, the more fortunate you start to feel. You realize you have come to the most meaningful spiritual teaching that can also exist. Why? Because they're talking about human happiness and suffering to the very root, to the very uh, foundation of what this means, to the highest levels and down to the very foundation. So you get inspired by understanding the treasure that you have in your hands. You know, you have this extraordinary treasure. Sometimes we praise our teachers. We go to school. The teacher teaches you mathematics. They teach you uh, English or whatever. And sure, sure, okay, great. It's important to have those kind of teachers. But what they give you is trifling compared to what the Buddha gives you. The Buddha gives you a gift that is far, far more valuable. That goes to the very core of what we really desire in our existence. Happiness, ending of problems, ending all of these things, uh, and this achieve something which has a lasting fulfillment and completion and contentment in our lives. There's nothing more to really be. This is it, really. This is, you know. <laughs> and uh, then you develop the joy and happiness, remembering how you have been living your life. Yeah, by remembering that you have feeling good about yourself. Think, wow, I'm keeping the five precepts. I'm going on meditation retreats. I'm hanging out with all these good people. Yeah, me. I'm living, doing, doing the right thing. Not in an egotistical way. You don't build up your ego in this way. You just feel a kind of quiet, warm feeling about yourself inside because you that you're living in the, in the right way. This is not egotistical at all. It's the exact opposite. Yeah, it is this knowledge inside of you that you're living well. And when you reflect on that, then uh, that happiness arises in your mind. Uh, yeah? This is one of the kind of basic ways of uh, uh, giving rise to joy in Buddhism. Uh, remember also all your Kalyanamitas, uh, all your spiritual friends that you have in the world, yeah? how fortunate you are to have all these spiritual friends, uh, have a sense of gratitude for all of these things that have been given to you, count your blessings. Uh, you've got so many blessings in life. Yeah? Wow, how fortunate I am. Uh, and this is how you give rise to joy. Focus on the positive things in life. And if, if you are a Buddhist path and have Buddhist spiritual friendship and all of these kind of things, wow, well, you've got so much. You've got much more than 99% of people in this world have. Yeah, you have got so much. You're on the right track. You're heading in the right direction. Something marvelous is happening in your life. And all you have to do is continue to develop it. Okay. okay. Um, there's about five more really good questions. Um, <laughs> shall we have a go at covering as okay. much as we can? Uh, let's try it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> okay. So someone's saying, my first teacher, Esengo Enka, emphasized developing equanimity with Vedana as the place that we could break the chain or weaken the chain of dependent origination. But after listening to your talk this morning, it seems that the four Upadana are another place where we can do it by letting go of or not grasping at sensory objects, views, etc. Letting go also seems to be core to what Ajahn Brahm is teaching to enable samadhi. Is letting go also a place where we can interrupt the chain of dependent origination? Okay. Um, it, it, this idea of uh, interrupting the chain of dependent origination, it really depends on what you mean by interrupting it. Yeah, And... Um, uh, sometimes I hear people say they want to break the chain of dependent origination in the link between feeling and craving. It's quite a common thing that you hear. And I think this may also be part of coming out of the SN Goenka tradition. But uh, it is important to understand that what we can do in the linkage between feeling, craving, and uh, uh, grasping, upadana, yeah, those three factors, what we can do, we can weaken dependent origination at that point. Uh, we can use those links to purify ourselves, to show sense restraint, to, to think about the world in a different way, to attach less to things, yeah, take less things up or take up the right things and let go of some bad things. 
But the purpose of that reduction in craving, the purpose of the shifting of attachments uh, is not to break the chain. The purpose is to purify the mind, uh, to purify the mind to such an extent that you can actually break the very first link, which is ignorance. So we use those links uh, later on in dependent origination. We reduce, we use that sequence uh, to reduce our defilements, uh, to think about the world in the right way, yeah? to brighten up the mind, to uh, improve our, our inner psychological existence. Baba is our inner psychological existence. We um, purify it, make it bright and beautiful to enable us to attain samadhi. That samadhi enables us to break the very first of the 12 links, which is ignorance. That is where the chain actually is broken. Because when ignorance is taken away, then craving falls by the wayside. Yeah, Because craving is sustained by ignorance, by delusion. With delusion, it no longer exists because you understand that craving is a, 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 cannot possibly create happiness and in its own right. So you give it up. Uh, but you can never just undermine craving in its, by itself without eliminating ignorance. Yeah? Craving is always going to be there based on feeling. Yeah? The only way you can eliminate it is by ending ignorance itself. Okay. Uh, I remember either from a retreat or talk from Ajahn Brahmali that if we have a good pure heart, we'll take this good pure heart into our next life. Is this true? And did I understand it correctly? <laughs> of course it is true. Absolutely true. Yeah. There is one thing that we carry with us from one life to another one, and that is our mind. Yeah. Our mind and our heart is the same thing. Yeah. There's different angles on the same, the same idea. So that is exactly the point. So, okay. Again, you know, you just look at your mind. Where is it inclining? What is it? Uh, what is its interest? And if you see that its interest is purity, is kindness, is morality, if that is what you're interested in, that is where your mind is leaning, and that is where you're going to get reborn. That's what you're going to take with you in the future. Yeah. Okay. So I've got a few about um, the wise associations. So I'll put them together. So um, does association with the wise mean areas specifically, or can it include all fellow practitioners? Also, can good people be non-Buddhist -good, uh, non good people? Will that also yeah. achieve uh, that particular criteria? Okay. So the um, good people, in, um, it really means the areas it means the noble ones yeah and the the reason for that is because unless you have the input from the buddha or someone who has seen the dhamma there is no way that you will be able to make that breakthrough you have to have someone to guide you someone who has seen that truth to be able to show you the same truth you can have as many ordinary good friends as you like but unless they have an insight they won't be able to show you the depth of what the Dhamma is all about. Yeah? So it actually matters obviously to have the Arya. And that is why I always recommend people to take the Buddha. Yeah? Because the Buddha, I mean, if someone, if anyone is an Arya, it's the Buddha. Yeah? And surely uh, you, can, you may doubt everyone else, but you can't really doubt the Buddha, as I said before. Yeah? But, uh, uh, the real, but of course, once you have an Arya, once you have some, you know, you have the writings there, if that is already in place, then other people can also be good friends. They can also support you on your path. Yeah, and uh, so once that is in place, then other people also, who you choose as your friends, who you choose to be hang around with, to socialize with, whatever, all of that will matter. If you socialize with people who help you to practice in the right way, who have similar interests to you, who kind of help you to reflect on life wisely, who help you to develop that rather than anger or whatever of course that is going to be helpful as well but only if you already have the areas at the very back there what about people of other religions sure if they are good people and if they help you to live well and do the right thing then they too can be good spiritual friends there may come a point when you have to uh, you know, separate and go a different direction, but uh, you can go a long, long way from path together, even with people of, the, of other religions. Yeah. So again, okay, on, 
Okay, uh, can we do a couple more? Sure, of course. Okay. Yeah. So again, yeah. about associating with the areas, if it's essential for stream entry, then how can women or nuns have equal chances for enlightenment? Um, monks have more to rejoice about when it comes to this piece. This association also enables monks to share conducive conditions that such people draw to them. And so there are more enlightened monks than there are nuns. <laughs> um, yes, it is. I think it is generally true that it is more challenging to be a nun or a bhikkhuni in the world than it is to be a bhikkhu. I think that is certainly true. Uh, look at the, how, how hard it is to establish something in the, in the UK or in Europe. Yeah, it's really difficult, it's really hard work. Sometimes it's is it lonely sometimes or is it okay? Is it? Yeah, sometimes it's quite lonely. And the only nun, so it, it is very lonely. <laughs> it's lonely being the only nun without a teacher, yes. Yeah, I, exactly. I can imagine because you have to pull the whole weight by yourself all the time, you know. So, you of course, it can get lonely. So, uh, I, I, you know, you're right that it is... Uh, in some ways, it's true. It is, you know, to be a monk, you are kind of very fortunate in many ways to be to be a monk. But uh, it is not impossible to be a nun. Yeah, it, the, it is still possible for a nun to have a. You know, it is probably true that there are more uh, monk areas in the world than nuns, simply because there are so many more monks than there are nuns. And there may very well be some nuns who are areas as well. For you know, I'm not entirely sure myself, but quite likely there are. And uh, sometimes we can have those relationships across the genders. Yeah, and uh, you know, you can certainly have a relationship with the Buddha. The Buddha is always available if you can draw inspiration from that. You can have a relationship with someone like Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahm doesn't really discriminate very much whether you are a male or a female. For him, it's all the same. You're a human being. So you are, you know, you are perfectly fine to associate with you. And there are, I know, a number of monks in the world who would be quite happy to teach nuns on, the, on a regular basis. So although you are right, and although I, you know, it is a shame that it should be difficult, more difficult for the nuns, uh, it is something that we just have to gradually try to overcome yeah by supporting the nun by making it possible for them to have the suitable conditions that we can create more female areas in the world and they can become inspiration for others and then we can kind of get the female sangha uh, established on a, on, a, on a very good footing again in the future uh, that would be great yeah it would be marvelous i i think it is so important that uh, uh, you know, a large part of the world's Buddhists are female. Females very often have a very strong interest in the spiritual path. And uh, we need female teachers. We need females who are um, kind of guiding lights for other females. Often we find more common with people of our own gender because we can relate better to people of our own gender. So it's important to have... Uh, you know, to have more nuns in the world, especially nuns who are really, really, really well trained. But I think all we can do really is to try to support the nuns to the best of our ability and then to try to build something up. I think, I don't know if there is any other shortcuts. I, I, what is your idea, Venerable Chandra? Do you have any, any, any comments on this? Yeah, I guess. The main reason I, I'm starting this project is because I do have the support of a very wonderful teacher, Ajahn Brahm, our teacher, and also of you, Ajahn Brahmali, who I consider a really good Kalyanamitta and somebody who's, you know, like I said in the beginning, quite a strong advocate for gender equity. So because of those opportunities, I feel like it's my responsibility to try and do what I can. But um, it is difficult being alone as one nun because uh, I think I miss out on having that sense of a sangha um, that's around me just to remind me what it means to, you know, take the monastic robe and to live the monastic life. And so just getting the support together is, is quite a job in itself. Um, so even though in the beginning of my monastic life, I had quite a lot of opportunities to meditate for prolonged periods of time, I would have preferred to go much deeper before being put out into this kind of role. So I think for nuns, it's important that we can keep in touch with good teachers, you know, to keep that, um, to keep our goal alive and not to get kind of swamped by 
um, the actual physical and emotional and spiritual work involved in setting things up. Yeah. I mean. uh, uh, yeah. It, I think people underestimate the kind of character it takes to kind of be the leader and to be self-sustaining and to be you know, keep on going without support. Actually, it's very, very difficult. Uh, and uh, it takes almost someone of Ajahn Brahm's kind of uh, qualities to be able to do that, you know, to, to really have, you have to have someone very deeply inside to be able to carry on like that, especially when you're all by yourself. Uh, mm. It's actually very, uh, so I, I, you know, I, I don't know, I, I, I really admire you for, for, for trying this. And I think it is really, uh, it is really admirable, and uh, <laughs> so I hope you're able to carry on and to uh, and to do this. And I hope you you know you will find the the, the support and things will, will go well. So we'll just have to, you know, uh, to, I guess just do our best and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I mean already with you know these kind of retreats that are happening through this project, it's a great cause for rejoicing, and it's bringing people together yeah. in the Dhamma in ways that, uh, like you say, Arjuna, so rare that people can contact the teachings that come straight through the early Buddhist texts, you know, and have the mm. Buddha's words explained and brought to life. It's just something really incredible and very rare, actually, especially mm. in Europe, I think, and in England. I think it's quite mm. hard, actually, to access this kind of depth and clarity. So, yeah, I'm very grateful to my teachers and to the whole community. Yeah. You know, it's a grassroots, but it's, it's off to a good yeah. start. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's all worked together. It happened. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, there's one more question. Shall we do one more? Yeah, sure. You're the boss. And, and, Just whatever. Yeah. yeah. As yeah. long as your energy is <laughs> yeah. okay and everyone's energy is okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. So someone's asking Is choices the best translation for Sankara? Choice implies making a conscious decision versus a, hab versus a habit pattern or a conditioned reaction, which seems more unconscious. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, you know, it's a matter of, uh, it's, it's a difficult one. Yeah, Sankara is one of those notoriously difficult words to translate. I, maybe I would prefer something like willed activities. Yeah, I think that might get to the core of what it means. But uh, choices is, is interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, you, you could perhaps argue that choices, you're, you're saying the choices are more conscious, but the, a choice might also be, could maybe argue that a choice could be unconscious as well. You're just making a choice kind of by habit or whatever. It's still a kind of a choice, but it's an unreflective choice perhaps or, <coughs> or something like that. I think it is within the... In the ballpark, yeah, it is not entirely entirely wrong, and and very often I think the uh, the idea is that when you uh, see a word translated in different ways, you get different, uh, you get a broader understanding of the word, what the word actually means, uh, and sometimes it is possible to obscure the dhamma in translation, which is virtually meaningless. Uh, yeah, the kind of the traditional translation of sankara will be something like volitional formations volitional formations <laughs> what does that even mean yeah I, you know i i mean i i've been a buddhist monk for like you know when i was helping vicky bodhi with uh, his translation of the numerical discourse i told him volitional formations this doesn't work you know nobody understands what this means i don't understand i've been a monk for almost 20 years i still don't understand really well i i sort of do but it doesn't do anything for me yeah when i hear volitional formation is i don't kind of jump up in joy yeah volitional formations. Wow, what a wonderful <laughs> translation it, it's um, it's Oh, it's, it's the opposite, yeah. It kind of turns you off a little bit because it is so dry and technical. And uh, so I wrote him and said, this, it, "It doesn't work. You need to change this." And uh, so I was one of the people who made him change the translation of volitional formations, and he actually uses activities in the numerical discourses instead, which is, to my opinion, a far preferable translation. It was actually a translation that he came up with himself, but it is it is uh, far better than uh, than. Uh, uh, volitional formations uh, and uh, so I think also choices choices is far superior to volitional formations because it means something to us it is something that you can relate to straight away and that's also why you can criticize it you can criticize it because you understand it volitional formation is so obscure you don't even know how to criticize it because it's just whoa, whoa what does this mean okay forget about it and you read on and you don't really consider it anymore yeah. 
So uh, yeah, look at things from different angles, and hopefully you will gain a broader kind of understanding of the Dhamma by taking in different translations and different ways of um, of rendering the the Pali here. Could I just okay. follow follow up a little bit on that, Ajahn? Because I'm just wondering yeah. um, why it is the outcome of the will or the outcome of the formations that we're talking about. Like, for example, isn't will doesn't will come before choice, and doesn't volition come before volitional formation? Is it not the actual volition rather than the formations of the volition that we're looking at? I, I, I'm losing a little bit. You, you, your volume is very low for some reason. Oh, can you? Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm wondering oh, um, yeah. Yeah. why we're looking at the kind of outcome of volition or the outcome of will. So we're talking about volitional formations and choices rather than volition or will. Because to me, I would have thought of that um, link more as where things are coming from rather than the actual outcome of volition. Am I making sense? So you mean more like motivation? Like uh, the will motivation. rather than the willed or the, the volition will. yeah. rather than the volitional formations. So what's behind yeah. these things that then leads to consciousness? Yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure to how, how much they can be kind of pulled apart. I think they're very closely related to each other. Yeah. And it's probably so close, I'm not sure if it is really meaningful to mm. divide it so much in, in that particular way, personally. Yeah. A volitional formation, it is a, um, yeah, a willed formation is just like a, something you do based on the will. You know, you form something. It's a creative act based on the will. And then kind of the act and the will are so impossible to draw the will out and the act out. I think they kind of come together almost uh, simultaneously. Mm. And it is when you do the willed act that is really powerful. The will itself is not very all that all that much, but it's actually the activity that comes with the will, of course, that really matters this place. So sankara, which is performed, is a far more powerful sankara than the sankara, which is just a kind of latent or not really doesn't do anything here. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, mm. I, I guess you could, uh, you know, refine it down a little bit, but uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much, Ajahn. And uh, I think that's, that's all the questions, I hope. So, wow. well done. That's yeah. Amazing. yeah. Amazing. Great. <laughs> okay. So Everyone, much. yeah, have a nice day. And we'll see you again tomorrow. So, bye bye. Sadu, sadu, sadu. <laughs> <laughs>